Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Welcome to this JDBC talk. Great to see so many of you here, the last day of the conference. You're still hanging in there. Congratulations. Uh, and JDBC, who thought people would be interested in that anymore? It's been around for so long, right? So let me start telling you a little bit about myself. My name is Thomas Risberg. My Twitter handle is at TRisberg. Uh, I'm currently a member of the Spring team at Pivotal. I'm contributing to the project Riff and the Spring Cloud Dataflow projects. And I joined the Spring Framework open source project back in 2003, starting to work on the JDBC support. And it all started way back in 2002 when I bought Rod Johnson's first book. And in that book, he introduced the JDBC template and, and the JDBC code that was uh, going along with it. So I had sent an email to Rod and said, you need some help. I'm willing to start contributing. And he said, sure. And I'm still working on the Spring project. So it's been a good, good ride. And uh, when I prepared the slides for this talk, I went through some old slides I had. So I found this old slide from 2005. And here I compare the old style JDBC where you had all the try catch stuff and just compare it to the Spring style where you just have a JDBC template and Spring does all the management around that and just cuts down so much in your code that I could never go back to writing straight JDBC. I probably wouldn't even know, remember how to do it anymore because it's been so long. So in terms of Spring JDBC, who does what? Right? And the data source and the connection configuration, that's up to you. But then Spring manages the connection as it's live. And you have to provide the SQL statements and the parameters. But then you don't have to loop through the result set. Spring does that for you. And all you do is provide a callback method or a row mapper implementation. So you have to map the data to whatever business object you have. And then Spring takes care of managing the transaction and if there are an exception, it will translate it into the data access exception. And those are runtime exceptions, so you don't have to do all the try catch stuff. So that's very convenient. And the basic Spring JDBC support, how many here actually work with Spring JDBC and JDBC template? And so it, pretty much all of you, that's great. <laughs> so you know that JDBC template is the classic approach and probably still the most popular. There's also a named parameter JDBC template that instead of using the question marks for placeholders, you can actually provide the names and that will be matched to whatever values you, you pass in in a map or, a, or as SQL parameter source. And then there are a couple of classes that make it easier to work with the inserts and JDBC calls and actually reads the metadata from the database to do as much work behind the scenes as possible so you don't have to specify all this stuff. And then there are two other, couple of other classes, the SQL update and store procedure and the mapping SQL query, which basically you write, it's a reusable thread safe object that you create. And there you typically create it when you initialize your data access code. And their usage is a little different. I don't use them a whole lot myself. I typically go to the JDBC template and the simple JDBC insert and JDBC call. That's my preferred way to work. And I have a demo that shows the different styles. And I'll be, I'll be tw tweeting the links to the slides and the sample repository after the talk so you can find that easily. So I have uh, three different implementations here. One is a JDBC template command line runner. So it's not a very exciting demo per se, but it uh, just shows you the different styles, how to get it configured. That's one thing when I look back at my old slides, there's so much of the configuration has changed, like Spring Boot now takes care of providing your data source and even the JDBC templates for free. 
earlier you had to do all that manual configuring of that. So here we just basically run an insert statement. And then in the simple JDBC, I do another insert here, just showing in the initialization, I actually create a simple JDBC object. And I just specify the table name and the columns I want to insert. And this is actually generating a key, so I get back the ID. And I could actually execute and I could actually get the insert a key back here if I used a different method. I can do execute and return key instead, then then I get the key that was inserted back. And I'm not gonna go through all these demos here. This is just sample code that you can clone this repo if you're interested. And the link it's in my GitHub account. So I, I'd like to spend a little bit more time talking about some other aspects of JDBC. And one uh, new development is the Spring Data JDBC project that was recently opened up. And it doesn't even have a release yet, not even a milestone release, so it's all snapshot builds for now. But it does provide you a repository implementation from the Spring Data Commons project, and it does use JDBC for that. So if you don't want to use a full-fledged JPA repository, but you still want some of the repository features, you could use this JDBC data repository. And it has provides you the CRUD operations for your business objects. It does support the ID generation, and you can provide a naming strategy to match your business objects to your tables. And it also has some events that you can intercept, like before or after delete, before and after save, and after the object's created. So you can customize the data that goes, actually goes in or comes out of the database. So it's still early days, and actually we had Greg Turnquist as another committer of Spring, he unfortunately couldn't make it to the conference and he was going to show you his demo app that he created. So I'll just point you to that application. And it's a Greg Turnquist's repo and it's called Spring Data JDBC Demo. And it shows you how to use that. So he creates an employee repository, and it extends the CRUD repository, which is a Spring Data Commons, the shared style for any of the JPA or Mongo repositories. And this is just an interface. You don't have to implement everything, because that will be taken care of by the Spring Data Commons and the Spring Data JDBC project. So you need to configure your repository in the JDBC part. So you do get a data source, but you, here Greg defines a naming strategy. So then table names can be mapped to the classes that actually contain the business logic data. And this is one of the object or with the 
what the business objects look like. This is uh, it's data because he's using uh, Lombok. And he has an ID annotation, which is the spring data commons ID right here. So that defines to the repository code what the ID is for, the, for this class. So this is a very simple little demo with a manager and an employee class. How many here are familiar with the Spring Data repository pattern? Yeah, okay, so m m almost all of you have looked at that. So this gives you, so this, basically this project gives you one more implementation of that. And if you want more, it's probably more lightweight than J JPA and it's not as feature rich either. But if it fits your use case, that's probably something to look at. Like I said, it's still early. This is still in build snapshot mode. You can look at the palm for this sample. So there's a Spring Boot starter, Lombok, starter JWC and then the Spring Data JWC project. And the auto configuration Spring Data JWC. And the version probably is CS. Oh, this is that one. Uh, this is even a snapshot that's a little bit customized to get this to run. So keep an eye on this project if you're interested in this. We should have a blog post about it coming up pretty soon. So now I want to talk about some other things that, like the world doesn't stand still, right? We start building applications one way in monoliths. Now we're moving to all different architectures, like microservices. We deploy stuff in the cloud. Some people are using event sourcing and CQRS for their data store approach. And we have reactive non-blocking APIs now. And now we also have serverless. So I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into the serverless part. And I'm just briefly gonna talk about the cloud deployments. And then talk about the event sourcing a little bit, but not much. So, so JBC in the cloud, how do you connect to the database? That's basically the problem, right? Your code runs the same, but you know, and if you use Cloud Foundry, it's reasonably easy if you have only have one data source because uh, the Java build pack will auto configure everything for you. If you have multiple, you need to do a little bit more configuration yourself. And if you're not happy what the, what the auto reconfiguration does for you, you can turn that off. There's a setting where you can disable it. And, but at that point, just do have to set your own spring profile. So you would probably still want to set the spring profile to be cloud, even if you do your own uh, JDBC configuration, because that basically turns off all the auto reconfiguration stuff. How many do deploy things on Cloud Foundry? All right, a few of you, okay. So basically when you run something on Cloud Foundry, so this is what I do to running the Greg's Spring Data JDBC demo. I just create a service and I, this time I use MySQL. And then I push my app to the Cloud Foundry instance I'm working with and everything else is kind of configured for me. And uh, on the left there, you see my manifest, where I basically specify the, the size I want for the, for the deployment, the memory, and what services I'm using. So it binds the MySQL to my application automatically. And I just specify my cloud properties to use the 
derive a class name for the J, for the MySQL. I don't think you even need to do that. I think it just injects a SQL driver if I even have that on the class path. And all these uh, cloud examples are also in the same repo like for Greg's example app. If I deploy it on Kubernetes, it's a little different. Then I have to do more configuration myself. And I have to actually specify in my config file, how many here have deployed anything on Kubernetes? Not too many, okay. So I did a, gave a talk yesterday on how to run Spring Boot apps on Kubernetes. So th this is, was covered there. I'm just, there's a config map on the left there that just defines my app, how I, how I want it to run in Kubernetes. And I set all these uh, properties for the data source in the application YAML. I just saw basically the URL and it, Kubernetes gives you an environment variables where your MySQL service and the port it's using. So I just use those environment variables here. And same thing for the password, it's stored in the secret. And I just pull that out in my configuration here. So this just shows that deploying on the cloud is a little bit different, but it's not a whole lot. It's basically how you get your data source running or connecting to it. And another reason you might want to start using JDBC again, or if, if you're using uh, event sourcing where you actually separate reads from writes, so you're not, they don't even have the same data model. So using JPA might not uh, buy you that much. So you might want to use either, and you might not even use a relational database for some of the stores. So, but when you do use a relational database, using JDBC gives you a lot of control. So it's a good choice for one or both of them. And there's another talk going on right now about breaking up a monolith and using events sourcing and CQRS. And if you're interested in that subject, there's a, you can look up the talk, it's by David Taransky and Rohit Kalapur. And uh, the new async reactive style, we're not quite there yet. We don't have an async JDBC driver. There's a proposal from Java 1 this year, driven by Oracle, and it's developed by the JDBC expert group. And there's a, you can look at the API that they are working with and you can send feedback to their mailing list, but there's really nothing you can download at this point and play with and test it. So I'm not sure what the time frame for that is. So until then, it's probably better to use different data stores if you're going reactive or there are techniques where you can use thread pools and put an async layer in front of the, your uh, blocking JDBC calls. So you, your app is not blocked, it just waits for them get, getting the results back in the future. And so some people have experimented with that. I, sometimes they have reported that their issues with the, with the threading, because it can, could use up a lot of threads. But uh, something to explore if you're really interested in that. I don't have much personal experience running that, so I can't give you more, but there's a, if you do a Google search on reactive JDBC, there's, there's some hits out there, people have been doing it. So I also wanna talk a little about serverless, and that might be a, a great choice for JDBC, because now you're writing a function, and you don't wanna have a long startup time well, the first time you hit the function, it will get a cold start. And if you use JPA, it typically takes a lot longer to load things up. So if you use JDBC, you get a shorter startup time and you're probably not doing a whole lot of work. You might just insert some data into a table. So JDBC is a great fit for that. 
So I put together a little sample app that uses the Spring Cloud function project. So I can actually take my function and run it on Project Riff, and I can also run it on AWS Lambda. And I haven't tried Azure Functions or OpenWhisk or AFM Project yet, but that's next on my list and should work fine there as well. So this is my function. So basically, I use a simple JDBC insert for this function. And it basically takes the input data, maps it to your uh, table using via the insert, using creates a SQL parameter source for that. And then I just insert it and return the key that was created during the in input. And then I log the key and return it. And what do I do to deploy this on Lambda? Well, I use uh, the CloudFormation script here, and it basically lists all the different things that where the location of the code, the URL and the username and everything that I need to connect to the database up in the cloud. Let's see if we can actually run this. So it might take a little while because that function is probably not running at the moment, so it has to start it up. Okay, we got something back. Status code 200, that's good. So we did insert a new object or, in the, or a new row in the database with the ID 12. And I'd like to run the same code in Project Riff. And for Riff, we have a little different configuration format, but it's basically the same thing. We create a, we point to a, here we point to a Docker image instead of a location up on AWS S2, S3, I mean. And, uh, Again, I have to provide all the connection parameters for the database, and I use that as uh, environment variables here. And if you want to try Project Riff, there's an easy way to install it. We use Helm. So that actually starts up a bunch of applications. And you see we got some of them running, some of them might not come up yet. I can always build my project for now.
Okay, it looks like they're all up and running. So I have a step-by-step -step how, how you get this running if you're interested in trying it out. I need to start up a database too. So once that is up and running, we should be able to deploy our your function here. I'm using a the mini cube. I'm running everything on a mini cube on my laptop here. So this just indicates that I want to use the Minikube's Docker environment. So when I can build my Docker file here, I already did a clean package. I just need to do the Docker build. It takes a little while to download the Docker image and then need that. Okay, that's done. So I have a, a YAML file that we sh looked at earlier. Just want to see. So here we have the actual URI for the function, which is on the file system here inside the Docker image I just built. And the name of the main class is the last parameter here. And the Spring Cloud function will look for this main class so he knows what app to call. So now I create this function resource and Riff will detect that this was deployed and should create another pod for it as soon as we it hasn't actually created a pod because we haven't asked we haven't tried to access the function yet so it doesn't exist as a pod but it do, should exist as a deployment and it's right here is our JWC writer and the current, the current count is zero and the desired count is currently zero. But as soon as we start posting some data there, you see the creating a container here. And again, there's a little startup time for the function, but you can keep the function running and you can set the timeout. After a while, the default is 10 seconds. Riff will get rid of your pod running and basically scale down to zero. Like you, know, you can see it's terminating there at the bottom. So that was a quick example of how you can use uh, JBC and the uh, New serverless world. And the last slide, I just put out some links to the different things we've been talking about the Spring JDBC core project, and the Spring Data JDBC project, the Spring Cloud Function project, and the project Riff documentation and source code. So if you're interested, follow those links and get some more info on that. I think I have one minute to get some questions. Any, anybody have any questions? Okay. Well, thanks for coming and hope to see you again next year. See what we can take this serverless stuff.
Okay, thank you.